Hey, Tyson here from Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. Thank you for listening to our message today. Refuge Church is a family of faith sent to proclaim hope in Jesus Christ through relationships. For more resources and information about Refuge, please visit us on the web at refugeph.com. Today, um, man, as we get in the Word together, um, that's a really fitting uh, song and even prayer over us, Ja. Um, just really sends like the Spirit guiding us right now because I believe that in our life as we come to know Jesus and we start to walk in our faith um, in Christ, there's a lot of things that we have to unlearn. There's a lot of things that the world teaches us, that culture um, tells us we should believe and we should think. And sometimes there's even things that we learn in church culture that don't necessarily line up with truth. And we begin to believe things. And it says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We know that in the future there's going to be an antichrist that's going to come, that's going to look a whole lot like Jesus, but he's going to be different than Jesus. He's not going to be the true Jesus, but he's going to lead a lot of people astray. The reality is, is that today there's a lot of lies that we believe and we begin to build foundations on those lies and begin to have even just whole life patterns built on things that aren't true. And uh, I've been in a season of my life of just going through the Word. And as I see things in the Word, I, I begin to realize once again that, man, I don't know that I really believe that. Like, I believe it and I know that this is true. But by the actions in my life, I, I think sometimes I have built some of my thought processes and my decision making on things that aren't straight what Jesus says. And so today we're going to go and we're, we're going to talk about fear and love. And in the world today, um, man, fear and love, I believe, are the two, like, two greatest motivators um, of all time. I think if there's going to be something that causes us to act or to do something, it's either going to come from a place, or the strongest point is either going to be from a place of fear, I'm afraid, or even a fear and a respect, or it's going to come because you love somebody. Um, we've seen people do incredible things because they, they love someone. Uh, you know, incredible stories. Um, I, I love reading through stories. Um, I have a, a little journal from my great-grandparents, and uh, I love to see what love motivated my grandfather to do for my grandmother. And it's just so sweet to see the links that they would go for one another. But at the same time, there's things that, that, that we see that fear does. I mean, when we experienced the COVID pandemic, we saw so many people riddled with fear, and it drove us to do things. And sometimes those things aren't always bad things. But here's the reality. The difference that we have in the church is that our greatest motivator, according to the Word of God, is love. And God's greatest motivator towards us is not His anger. It's not His wrath. But it is his love. And so today I want to look at a passage in the, uh, in the letter of John. And we're going to begin to go through and just see a few things about what the word says um, about who God really is. Because the reality is this. If you begin to read through scripture, there are many instructions throughout the Old Testament to fear the Lord. Okay? And we know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is a good thing. It is something that, that, uh, that we are instructed to have throughout the Old Testament. But there's a positive and there's a negative side of the fear of the Lord. And when the Bible uses that phrase, fear of the Lord, the positive side of it is that people understand how great and mighty and strong and powerful God is. And therefore, they love Him and they worship Him. That's when the fear of the Lord um, is, is, is operating in a positive light. The negative side of the fear of the Lord is that we fear His punishment and His mighty hand of wrath falling on us. And the reality is, is when we begin to step into the New Testament, the New Testament actually stands for the New Covenant. See, there was an Old Covenant. The first part of the Bible has to deal with with, with this old covenant where God said, listen, Israel, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. But here's your end of the deal. I need you to, I need you to uphold the Ten Commandments. The greatest of those Ten Commandments, the thing that precedes all of those, is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
But what happened was Israel failed to do their end of the covenant. So throughout time, what we see God do is he gives a new covenant. In Jeremiah, we can read about that new covenant. We're not going to right now, but I'll paraphrase it for you. The new covenant is essentially this. Since Israel couldn't uphold the law, God says, I'm going to actually write the law on your heart, and I'm going to remember your sin no more. He's no longer going to hold their sin against them. And so all this anger that God has towards sin, he dumps on Jesus. And the beauty of the gospel for us today is that as God looks at us, for those of you who are in Christ, who have confessed Jesus as your Savior, who believe in Jesus, know this. That God, he took his wrath and his anger towards your sin. He placed it on Jesus so he looks on you with love. And I think a lot of us go through our life sitting there thinking, man, is God mad at me? Is God upset with me? And the reality is this. If you are in Christ, the word says you are a new creation. As a new creation, when God sees you, he sees the righteousness of his son, of Jesus Christ. He calls you a son or a daughter. And so what that means is, is that we have a different motivator now that we are in Christ. A different thing that moves us in our relationship with God. And we're going to read a passage today. We're going to focus in on it in a moment. But the passage says this, that perfect love casts out fear. There's no fear in love. And it says fear has to do with punishment. But the reality is this. There is no fear of God punishing us if we are in Christ. And so the beauty that we can, of that and the gospel actually working itself out in our life right now is that when we enter into relationship with God, we don't need to go in there with fear like, God, are you mad at me? God, are you upset with me again? No. If we are in Christ, there is no fear in love. If there is fear that we have, what the Word says is love hasn't been perfected in us yet. So today, as we just build our understanding of who God is um, let's get into the Word. Let's start reading in 1 John chapter 4. Now, just so you know, there's a Gospel of John at the beginning of the New Testament. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these Gospel accounts. The cool thing about 1 John is it's like the Cliff Notes version of John. I like Cliff Notes. That helped me get through school. Okay? So, so book and, and letters like this, like 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, that helps me get through the Bible. All right? So, the cool thing here is we're going to have condensed down like, like chapters of John in these verses here. Okay? So, let's take a moment to just let the words sink in. Um, and let's begin to read here in 1st John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love God does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we, have, we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and he hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. All right. 
There's a lot there. There's a lot of repetition of the word love, though. And I think if there's one thing that's very important that we remember about God's greatest motivation towards us, both like throughout the Bible, and just know this, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, God did not change. Okay? God's anger towards sin has not changed. It's been settled on Jesus Christ. But the nature of God has not changed at all. The covenant did, though. And the covenant that we live under, this new covenant, based on faith in Jesus Christ, trusting in his body and his blood broken for us, shed for us, that new covenant is definitely a better covenant because God is not holding his anger. He's, he's not got it stored up waiting for a lightning bolt to strike us. The lightning bolt hit Jesus on the cross. And that is so important to believe. And I'm going to continue to share that with you because I have met so many believers today that live in fear that God is out to get them. And he has settled that on the cross once and for all in Jesus Christ. The beauty of the gospel, the good news that God loves us is the fact that we get to live without that kind of fear in our life, that fear of punishment. And now all we have is the positive side of fear, just awe and wonder and respect that this mighty God who hates sin but loves us dearly would want to have a relationship with, with us and elevate us to be a son and a daughter in his kingdom. So the very first point that I want to make here is that God is love. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. That's his defining characteristic. Okay? So as you begin to think, man, I wonder what God's like. I wonder what God thinks about me. First of all, God loves you. Okay? Second thing that we see in this passage is that the love of God is received through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 15 says this, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So whoever confesses Jesus is the Son of God, you get into this relationship of abiding. Now, the Gospel of John explains this whole relationship of abiding. It takes a whole chapter to do it. And it utilizes this picture of a vine, like a grapevine. And uh, and what it starts to compare the grapevine to... Um, is, is Christ, and then like we are these branches that are connected to Jesus. But the connective tissue is love. What we are abiding in is the love of God. But the thing that's very important for us to remember is that I think sometimes we put this pressure on ourselves. We're just like, man, I just... I, mean, I, hadn't, I hadn't loved enough, you know? I don't know, like I'm not loving God enough. But here's the reality. God actually supplies the love that we need in order to do his command, in order to love him and the world. So that's the third thing I want to point out in this passage. God's love for us supplies the love we have for him and others. Here's what it says in verse 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation just means Jesus took our place. We deserve the punishment. But Jesus took our place. He took the punishment for us. Again, that is is so important for us to understand as far as our view of God and how we think God thinks of us. Because we're not standing in this place of shame anymore. We're not standing in this place where we're awaiting punishment. We have escaped punishment. He is the propitiation for our sin. And I mean, we know the wage of sin is death, but what the word says is the gift of God's eternal life in Christ Jesus. Again, Jesus is so central to us understanding and receiving this love. The fourth thing I see in this passage is this. Those abiding in God have his spirit. Now, if we have his spirit, we have his, his, his nature a part of that spirit as well. In the Gospel of John, in John 14, God also explains, and Jesus is sitting there, and he's explaining to his disciples what's going to happen. Because Jesus spends all this time with them, he teaches them, and now he's preparing them to leave, to go away, to be crucified, and then to finally ascend into heaven. And here's what he says to his disciples. He says, my spirit's going to come upon you. He's going to be your helper. He's a spirit of truth. So we have this spirit of God living within us. 
And so this is what the word says here in verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Here's something that we all need to, to realize here. When you make a confession of faith in Jesus Christ, okay, and you step into this relationship with the Lord, this relationship of love, you now have his spirit available to you. And so with his spirit available, with this spirit of truth living inside of you, you know what you can do? You can, in your time of prayer, you can go before the Lord and you can say, God, I've got all these thoughts in my head. Would your spirit of truth help me determine which ones are of you and which of them are lies? And what the spirit of truth will do, what the Lord will do for you, is he will begin to expose the lie, and he's very gentle in that. One of the things, and I'm going to chase a rabbit really quick, another thing we, we say is we say, well, the, well, the Lord disciplines those he, he loves. Is that not a part of God just being angry and upset with me? The reality is this. God's defining characteristic is love. And what Ephesians says that love is, is love is patient, it's kind, and it's gentle. Okay? If you are not receiving patient, kind, and gentle thoughts of truth in your mind, it is not the king speaking to you. That is not his spirit. Now, here's what we can begin to do. As we begin to have these thoughts, okay, Again, we go back to the word and we go back to the truth that the spirit of truth is in us. And we, we subject those things to the Lord and we say, God, this is what I'm feeling right now. But I don't know if this is true. Would your spirit of truth reveal that in my life? And the thing is, is that if there's something that's, that's out of alignment, he will gently bring you back. And yes, the Lord disciplines. But many of us have experienced discipline in our life paired with anger. Like in our homes and stuff, and even on the football team or, or wherever, we, we've, you know, in school, oftentimes when we experience discipline, it is somebody very angry, yelling at us. It is somebody who's burning inside. Again, God's anger for, has been settled on the cross, and Jesus, he is full of love for you, and so he actually disciplines us through love. And the word says he disciplines those that he loves. So understand this, if you ever receive discipline from the Lord, which you will, it will be in this gentle way from him, okay? Now, as we continue, um, the fifth thing that I see in this passage, and I've brought this up many times already, um, it has to do with fear. Those abiding in God's love have no fear. I think this is something that's very important, um, as I've already stated, but I want to go back through and I want to just slowly read through this passage again. Starting in verse 17. By this is love perfected with us. So that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear. For fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Okay, so we start that in verse 17. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence. Listen, if you're in Christ, you have every reason to be confident in your relationship with the Lord. Confident to go to Him in prayer. Confident to come before Him. And confidence ultimately on the day of judgment. Again, if you were not in Christ, again, God's... Fire towards sin is still there. He still hates it. Still doesn't want to do anything with it. He still desires that you love him. And for the person that has not received the love of Jesus, on judgment day, they have to account for their sins without the righteousness of Jesus covering them. But if you've trusted in the righteousness of Jesus covering your sin, then you have great confidence. Because you have great confidence that God's wrath has been settled on the cross in Jesus Christ, then you have no reason to live your life in fear of punishment. And that's what this is explaining to us. So God is not out to punish you. That's the beauty of what Jesus already absorbed for you. So as we continue in this, this is what I've found in my own life. If I begin to view God as the punisher, though, okay, I begin to think, man, God is just, he's, he, he hates my sin and I've sinned and he's coming to get me. Then I start to do religious obligations simply to appease God. Like I, I try to get to this place where I can just 
make God happy. And I'm always trying to just see if I measure up. And I fall back into this works mentality where I start to just really elevate myself. And some days I'll sit there and say, you know, I bet God's happy with me today. I preached today. I led worship today. You know, I shared my faith today. I didn't cuss anybody out today. You know, like I, I did something. I, I, was, I was a good husband today, you know. And I begin to think, God, I bet you're pleased with me today. And then that same mentality creeps in and I sit there and I, I just doubt my faith one day. Or I sit there and I, I have this, I, I start to get anxious and not trusting the Lord. Or I go and I, 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 I break one of the Ten Commandments, you know. Or I sit there and I, I tell a lie. Or I, you know, I, Danielle comes to me with a, with a question or with a problem or something. And I am not a good husband in return. And I yell at her. You know, and I come and I think, God, you've got to just, you're so upset with me. But the reality of the word is that, man, you know what? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Like he's already dealt with that frustration on the cross with Jesus. And he loves me. And it's at that place of my daily experience of the gospel that it moves my heart to truly worship him. And I think the, the beauty of worship is that it's not something that we do out of religious obligation to appease God. Christ has appeased everything that God requires. We now worship strictly out of love because we've been filled up with it. Now that we've been forgiven much, we can do what? What the Word says, we can love much. And so when I view God as the Savior, I mean, I worship Him from this place of this deep longing and desire. This deep love in my soul starts to come out. Things start to become a lot more natural. And so as we process this out and we look at this, um, I, I want to I go to the last verse, or the, the first and the last verse of the passage I just read. When we start out in verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another. I want you to remember... The Father addresses you as beloved. Okay? Again, He gave you His Son because He loves you. You are His loved ones. Okay? So if you're wondering, you're like, God, what do you think about me right now? Everything I've done in my life, my accomplishments, my good, what do you think about me? First of all, beloved. He loves you. Right? Now, because you've been filled up with love... You can actually fulfill the next command to love one another. And so verse 7, it starts off, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And then it ends with these verses. Let's just go down here to verse 20. <clears throat> if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother... Whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God, must also love his brother. As we begin to step into this, the reality that God truly loves me, then we become freed up to lead others in that love. As we step into the freedom that I don't have to live my life in fear as I think about God, I can share that good news with my friends, with my brothers and sisters, I can remind them of their freedom from that fear as well, and I can lead them in love. But the other side of it, if we think our life is all about just our works and our obligations that we do for Jesus, we begin to hold others to that standard as well. Again, should there be good works in our life? Absolutely. Faith without works is a dead faith, but the motivation is everything. The motivation is not fear. The motivation of it is not uh, you know, pride or selfishness or anything like that. The motivation is sheer love. So God loves you dearly, and then he sends you out with that love to love your neighbor, to love your brother, to love your sister. And so today, um, as, as we just continue to think about the application of this passage, um, here's what I want to begin to ask you just for you to think about today. Um, 
What would you say motivates your actions? As you, as you start to think through like why you do what you do, what would you say motivates you? I don't know how many years that I have worked a job and I have worried so much about what my, my boss or my employer or my peers at my work thought about me. And I was ultimately motivated by fear of failure. Did not want to fail. Wanted to please everyone. I want to exceed your expectations. But what would happen in our lives if instead of being driven by that, our greatest motivation in the day was, Lord, you, you love me so much that you pulled me from this pit. You set my feet upon a rock, right? And, and you, you established my steps, and you love me, and you care for me. And so today, Father, I'm just going to go wherever you send me. I love you, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to share your love with others. So I want you to begin to think about that. What motivates you? Again, the spirit of truth is ignited inside of you when you say, Lord, would you show me what motivates me? I love the Psalms, but one of the Psalms that's so great is where the Psalms walk us through this, this search me and know me, God. God, I've just laid myself before you. Search me, know me. Help me figure out myself. God, I don't get it, right? As we think about that, what do you think about God? What do you think God thinks about you? Again, the enemy has crept in and he's told a lot of lies to us. He's told a lot of things and he has, you know, think about the, the garden for a moment. When Adam and Eve struggled when they sinned, when, when it started with that, you know, that deception, what did the enemy start to do? He immediately questioned what God said. He began to twist what God said. And there's a lot of times in our life, that's the lie that we start to believe is something that gets twisted. It started off, and it seems like truth. It seems like it might be right, but it gets twisted again. We've got to subject all those things to the king. Let the spirit of truth help us know what he says. Because again, the address here is beloved, loved ones. Not people that I'm mad at. Not people that my, my anger is burning against. But my loved ones. And as we begin to process this out today, you know, the commission of Jesus is to go make disciples. Jesus says, when my spirit comes upon you, you will be my witness. So there's something about us coming and getting connected to the love of God, his spirit bearing witness in our hearts that he actually is present in us. But then there becomes this natural sending that we go and we share that love with others. And today, as we think about that, I believe a lot of times, again, we can come from a shame, from an anger, from a judgment side of things and sit here and say, you need to go share your faith. You need to do this. But honestly, I want to just encourage you to do this. Would you just sit at the feet of Jesus and receive his great love? Because in my life, that's the only thing that's compelled me to go and tell somebody else about it. And the reality is that if we've experienced the gospel fully in our heart, that God loves us, and that perfect love is inside of us, then I go out without fear. I live my days without fear of punishment. My prayers are not, am I doing the right thing or not? It's just, Lord, I, I want to sit, I want to receive from you. So as you process this today, uh, my prayer for us is that the gospel just stirs in your heart today that like the reality that Jesus loves you so much and wants to give you freedom right now freedom from the lies that you believe and ultimately freedom from fear man I, I, I just pray that you receive that deeply because I want our neighborhoods and our families to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ but I think for us sometimes it just has to get lit back inside of us again that it's real and that I need it right now so, Josh, you come and you, you lead us in this last song. This last song uh, is an invitation to come to the altar and that the Father's arms are open wide, that he's ready to receive you today. The beauty of the gospel is that we do nothing to achieve it. Oftentimes we read the Bible and we read the Ten Commandments and we sit there and think, I've got to, I've got to achieve this. We read all through Scripture 
I need to be better. I need to be better. I need to be better. Understand this. Jesus is perfection, and he has accomplished it, and he gives you his righteousness. So the gospel is not about striving. It is all about receiving his love. As we receive his love, we are then compelled to go and do his love. And that's what we see here in John. Beloved, listen, God is love. God is love, and that's what we're called to. We're called to be that same love. But the only way you're going to actually be that love is just to receive it. Our human love is not enough. We must simply just receive the good news of the king, that he loves you. That's the beauty of the gospel. It's nothing less than that. It's nothing more than that. The word gives us instruction to not add anything else to it, but just preach Christ crucified. Jesus died for your sin because God loves you. Preach that. Tell that to your waitress, to your waiter. Tell that to your neighbor, that he loves you dearly. And I believe there's a lot more freedom for us to experience together as a church. But today, I hope for, for once, maybe, maybe there's some freedom from some fear about how God perceives you, that he truly loves you and you're free of punishment. So let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. I encourage you just as you're sitting in the room today, just to receive his love. And as you feel led to stand and sing, um, do that. Father, thank you for your salvation, that you love us dearly. Thank you for the confidence we have in your word, that there is no fear and love, God, and you are love, and so there's no fear in relationship with you, God. At the same time, Lord, would you stir in our hearts this great awe and wonder. That fear of the Lord that just drives us to love you and worship you and trust you. Father, thank you for giving us a refuge, a place of safety. Thank you for caring for us, for providing us what we need to eat, God, what we need to wear. For meeting every need and ultimately, God, our longing for love, our longing to belong our longing, God, in our souls to be connected to something. God, you are, you fulfill all of those things. So, God, would you just continue to speak your truth in our hearts today? That your spirit would resonate deep in our souls and that we would be a fearless church, Father. What would happen, God, if we truly walked out of here without fear of punishment and we lived our life that way? And we share that good news with others, God. What would happen? I pray that we would take more risk for your kingdom. Father, thank you for the invitation to come, to follow, to be healed. And uh, we receive that today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message today brought to you by Refuge Church. Please visit our website for more resources as well as our YouTube channel. Just search for Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee to find us. We hope that this message has helped you find hope in Jesus Christ.